Welcome to the U.S. Access Board's forum titled Inclusive Design of Autonomous Vehicles, a Public Dialogue. This is the fourth session in series. Today's topic is Accessibility for Passengers with Sensory and Cognitive Disability, Part 2, Ride Hailing and Onboard Communication. Ladies and gentlemen, public member Karen Tamley. Ms. Tamley. Thank you, Rose. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the fourth and final session of the Access Board's public forum on inclusive design of autonomous vehicles. I'm Karen Tamley, a public member of the Access Board. We're very pleased by the turnout today and the strong level of interest and engagement we've had throughout the forum. Autonomous vehicles have the potential to open up a whole new world of travel for people with disabilities, including those who are not able to drive. But it's critical that autonomous vehicles are designed and operated to be inclusive of everyone, including people who use wheelchairs or other mobility devices people who are blind or low vision, or deaf and hard of hearing, or who have a cognitive disability. The board has undertaken this forum to collect and share information on how to design and engineer autonomous vehicles that are accessible to all passengers. Our program this afternoon will continue the discussion from the last session on communication accessibility for passengers with sensory or cognitive disabilities. As in the previous sessions, we're fortunate to have several invited presenters who will be sharing their expertise and information on the subject. Again, thank you all for being here today and we look forward to a great session. I'll now turn things over to Sarah Presley, an accessibility specialist at the Access Board who will open the program and introduce our guest speakers. Thank you very much, Karen. And before we get into today's agenda, please note that the Access Board is not undertaking rulemaking on autonomous vehicles at this time. The Board is conducting these sessions solely for the purpose of exchanging facts and information about the accessible design of autonomous vehicles and to hear thoughts from individuals on how to ensure that AVs are accessible to and usable by persons with disabilities. Our speakers have been invited to share information related to the accessible design of autonomous vehicles. However, their inclusion in this panel does not constitute an endorsement by the Access Board or any of our federal agency partners of any product, service, organization, or technical solution. Okay, now that we're done with the legalese, we do have a packed agenda today. We will first hear from Dr. Aaron Steinfeld from Carnegie Mellon University. Next, we will hear from Dr. Greg Vanderheiden from the University of Maryland. He will be followed by Daryl Cooper from the Federal Communications Commission. Next will be Ted Guild from the W3C. And our final presenter will be Bruce Bailey from the Access Board. After the presentation, we will move to Q&A for the panelists and to open discussion, giving attendees an opportunity to ask questions and make comments. And once again, the PowerPoint for today's presentation is available for download at our website, www.access-board.gov slash AV as in autonomous vehicles slash. Okay, the next slide, please. There are a few ways you can participate in today's event. First, our moderator, Bruce Bailey, will take questions for the presenters. Please submit your questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. There is no need to wait until the end of a presentation to submit a question. After all of the presentations have concluded, our moderator will read questions and give the presenters a chance to respond. You may also participate in today's event by contributing to the open discussion. Using Zoom's Q&A feature, 
indicate your interest in participating in the open discussion and please include your name, your organization, and the nature or subject of your comment and include the word microphone if you wish to speak. Again, you may indicate your wish to participate in the open discussion at any time during the event. If you have been queued up to speak, the host will let you know ahead of time via the chat feature and will enable your microphone. The moderator will then announce when it's your turn to unmute yourself and speak. If you wish to be visible for signing, please indicate that in your request. If you are calling in today or if you're having some difficulty with the Q&A feature in Zoom, you may email your request to speak to events at access-board.gov. Finally, after today's event has concluded, thanks to our partners at the Office of Disability Employment Policy with the Department of Labor, the public dialogue continues online at transportationinnovation.ideascale.com. If you have not already done so, please register to contribute comments on this dialogue. Though this is the last session of our forum, the online dialogue will remain available for two more weeks. Next slide, please. And now I would like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Aaron Steinfeld. Dr. Steinfeld is an associate professor, research professor at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. He has been the principal investigator and co-director for the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center, or RERC, on accessible public transportation since 2008. He also leads other projects on accessible transportation, inclusive technologies, and human-robot interaction. His research focuses on human interaction with complex systems. He received his PhD in industrial and operations engineering from the University of Mission, Michigan and completed a postdoc at UC Berkeley. Dr. Steinfeld, welcome. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to preface this conversation by uh, making it clear that this sort of work is a team sport. And uh, you'll notice in my slides, it says that all. And that's because uh, most of what I'm gonna be presenting here is is work that involves a large number of people, both within my team and our collaborators outside of our team. Um, so next slide, please. Um, these collaborations and these activities are supported by a number of different projects. I'm going to draw from a bunch of different uh, uh, efforts to describe uh, some of the insights that we've learned uh, over the years. This includes fu uh, funded research from Nidler uh, specifically on accessible uh, public transportation, uh, some funded work from the ATRI program at USDOT, um, and some related work that's been done under uh, robotics funding uh, within the National Science Foundation, Office of Navy Research, and NASA. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the core issues of getting into an autonomous vehicle is actually getting it to come and pick you up. Um, and uh, one of the things that we know from uh, history of working in uh, transit information systems is uh, many of the information technologies <laughs> can be can be made accessible uh, using uh, traditional well-known uh, uh, practices, best practices. Um, we have other speakers in this talk in this series today that are experts in this. Greg Vander Hayden, the W3C, have uh, done a lot of work in this area. Um, and the main lesson is that these uh, best practices need to be uh, extended into the autonomous vehicle service uh, infrastructure. This means smartphone apps, this means kiosks at stations, this means the touch screens and interfaces within autonomous vehicles. And this can all be done, it just needs to, needs to be done. Um, one of the things though that we have learned uh, in these advanced transportation systems is that users often don't know what the features and functions are because many of them are hidden. Uh, and so surfacing what, what matters for an individual is going to be important, especially when there is no transportation training available uh, from any sort of constituents uh, support service. Um, the other thing that we know is that speech systems are going to become increasingly common for these types of uh, uh, requests, you know, calling, much like how you might call for, in the old days, call for a taxi. 
Um, we're going to see the same thing happening here uh, for autonomous systems. I will tell you, because based on work that we've been working on in conversational agents, um, that there still needs to be a lot of advances that are nuanced and specific to transportation. Um, most importantly, things related to time. A lot of these uh, conversational systems aren't very good at complex, what we consider simple, but they consider complex time uh, interactions, such as asking uh, a service to pick you up 15 minutes before five. Um, to us, that's natural. To an AI system, that can be confusing. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, then you have to actually get to the vehicle on the curb. Um, and in many cases, where to pull up on the curb is going to be restricted or driven by local infrastructure and policy. But the reality is that large amounts of street infrastructure in the United States, uh, you can pull up just about anywhere. Um, and so uh, identifying where there are crowds of people, where there's empty space, how crowds are moving is going to be important. Knowing that if you position yourself in a certain spot, it's easier for the person to come and uh, cross uh, the, the sidewalk to get to you. This is gonna matter a lot in urban environments. A human driver sees this and thinks about it and can reason about where to pull up and stop uh, to support these kinds of motions. Likewise, um, the uh, uh, human who's trying to get to the vehicle um, may be using some technology to assist that. I'm gonna cover that in the next slide, but um, the but you still want to kind of support getting to the spot uh, in a safe and uh, uh, um, direct manner so that the person is not um, going to be stuck uh, in any uh, uh, crowd while they're trying to get to us to, to the vehicle that's picking them up. This is especially important at busy transportation hubs. Um, and any of you who have tried to catch a, a taxi uh, or, a, or a ride share system at a busy transportation hub knows what I'm talking about. Um, next slide, please. So the other problem that happens a lot is finding the vehicle that you need to get into. Uh, if we see a large number of autonomous vehicles out in the, in the world, um, what we're likely going to see is uh, scenarios where you will go to get a vehicle and multiple vehicles will be coming up and multiple users will be kind to get, trying to get up. Um, again, if you've tried to pick up a taxi or a, or a ride share at a transportation hub, you know this is a challenge uh, for everybody. Um, but it's even harder for someone who has uh, uh, disabilities that affect their perception. Um, so audible signals, as mentioned in the, in the prior session, uh, can be problematic because they can identify the person as having a disability. This uh, exposes the user to a number of uh, undesirable situations. Um, visual signals, um, those, there are some, some organizations that do this now where in, you know, unique colors or lights are shown in the vehicles to tell you which one is yours. Um, this is fine if you can see it, but the reality is that this is very hard to see even uh, uh, by people who are sighted um, and uh, that can be problematic. Uh, uh, so this is not, so, so sighted symbols are not always gonna be the, the, the right strategy here either. Um, we are looking at how to solve this problem by leveraging the fact that there are sensors on the vehicles and there are, and, and uh, in many cases, people will have a phone that is equipped with certain technologies that will support uh, coordinated interaction between the two uh, computational systems, the phone and the car, uh, to link the person up. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, the other thing that's going to happen is we're gonna see a lot of reliance on artificial intelligence. Um, uh, to try and drive down some of the customer service costs, but also to make it easier to use these, these types of systems. So the picture here shows a, a transit information app that we have been uh, testing and developing that looks at how uh, uh, learning individuals' preferences can uh, speed the, uh, the, lower the effort it takes to get the information a person wants about a transit system, uh, sorry, transit stop. Um, we're going to see the same thing in autonomous vehicles. Uh, these systems will learn your common destinations. They will learn your, the way that you prefer to interact with them. Um, these kinds of artificial intelligence uh, features are going to become increasingly important in order to streamline and lower the, the level of effort for interaction. Um, you don't want to, for example, if you need captioning, you don't want to be getting into a vehicle every single time telling it, please turn on the captioning. You want it to just know and do it. Now, this creates some tension because there is some 
uh, uh, potential privacy loss and uh, data sharing that you may or may not want to see happen. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I mentioned I, that our team does a lot of work in robotics, uh, uh, and we've learned a bunch of different things from this that we think are going to have a direct impact on uh, how people use autonomous vehicles. And these could have severe influences on how people with disabilities use autonomous vehicles. So the first is that um, people often have mismatched trust in these autonomous uh, systems and robots. So you might have too little trust or too much trust, and this can cause all sorts of problems. You could imagine how overtrust could put a person into some dangerous situations, um, while undertrust uh, may lead to all sorts of uh, accessibility barriers that a person may encounter. Um, the other thing that is really important uh, in any kind of autonomous system, but is especially important when you're talking about something that is moving and has a large mass and could be very dangerous, is uh, self-assessment of performance. These, these cars are gonna need to be able to inform the users about their capabilities or changes in their capabilities. And this could lead to some severe uh, barrier pro accessibility problems. So for example, a vehicle that uh, is having trouble driving because of weather conditions and decides to pull over to the side of the road, um, it, you know, if it just assumes that the, the rider is sighted, um, it might figure, well, you can tell I can't go where I'm, I can't drive right now, it's too, it's too hard. Um, but a person who's blind will not know that and will need that kind of uh, uh, communica communicated information. Likewise, if you're a bystander uh, not in the vehicle, you do need to know uh, what's going on. So uh, if an autonomous vehicle is, behaving, is, is, is not behaving well and it's pulling up to a curb, um, you know, uh, again, a sighted person might see erratic driving, but a, a person who's blind will not. And so these things need to be communicated in an accessible form. Um, we also have done some work on uh, what we call re-embodiment or uh, uh, AIs that move from one thing to another. Um, you can imagine a situation where um, you're talking to uh, uh, something like a, a voice agent on your phone, uh, an, an artificial intelligence, and you get in the car and that agent jumps into the car and starts talking to you through the car speakers. Um, there are a lot of good reasons why you might wanna do this. Um, but on the flip side, uh, if that's a shared ride with other riders, uh, you may want the agent to stay interacting with you through say a headset instead of through the car speakers um, uh, for disclosure reasons. Um, we've seen problems in robotics research where um, two users who are, are interacting with the same piece of technology um, uh, and something about one user is disclosed in front of the other user uh, because the robot is trying to, to be personalized in the way it interacts with the, per with the, uh, the two users. Um, so uh, we think that this is an area that is going to, th these sorts of re-embodiment where the artificial intelligence is jumping from one machine to another machine um, is going to become increasingly common. Um, and there's all sorts of subtle interaction problems when that happens if uh, it's not designed properly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and again, uh, this work has been funded by a wide range of sponsors uh, and I'm happy to uh, uh, answer questions. My email is uh, listed here, it's also in the slides. Um, and uh, I'll hand it over back to uh, um, the organizer. Okay. Okay. Sorry for that little glitch, folks. I was getting a message that I couldn't start my video because the host wouldn't let me. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Can somebody hear me? Yes. yes okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Steinfeld. We will now move on to our next presenter, Dr. Greg Vanderheiden. Dr. Vander Heiden is the director of the Trace R&D Center and a professor in the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. He has been active in the field of technology and disability for 50 years and was a pioneer 
in the fields of augmentative communication, assistive technology, and computer access. His research projects include the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure Automated Personalization Computing Project, the RERC on Universal Interface and Information Technology Access, and the RERC on Inclusive Information Technology. Dr. Van der Heiden holds a PhD in Technology and Communication Rehabilitation and Child Development from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Van der Heiden, welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the, um, uh, the goal of the presentation today is going to be to highlight some of the, the many things that need to be considered in designing autonomous vehicles for use with people with cognitive disabilities. And this is actually much more complicated than it first appears. Um, it appears complicated, but it's even more so when you really get into it. And, and Aaron uh, highlighted some of the uh, issues in his presentation quite well. But if we can crack the problems, if we can actually make this system accessible to people with cognitive disabilities, it's going to be a tremendous advance uh, for these user groups. And I say groups because cognitive disability is not a group. It's a wide range of groups. The first thing we need to remember is that cognitive disabilities do not occur in a vacuum. So if we think we're going to solve them with some one approach, that's going to be a problem. Often the person will have a cognitive disability and also have a physical disability or a vision or hearing, or they may be deaf and only speak in sign language, um, or they may have a di speech disability. They may have uh, non-vocal or dysarthria or aphasia or a stutter or a stammer, things that would prevent us from doing things or be successful with some of the strategies we often think of like, well, just have them carry on a conversation. For these individuals, many of the general solutions aren't going to work. Speech interfaces, well, it requires speech. Selecting things uh, where you just pick your destination, well, that requires reach and vision. Um, having them insert or touch something that is gonna pass information requires reach and it requires manipulation. So none of these things by themselves, although all of them may play a role in terms of what we're trying to do. So we need to find something where we have a spectrum of interface solutions um, that are all present and the person is able to uh, select amongst them to pick what was gonna work for them. Now, also we have to keep in mind that problems can occur in route. For example, people may change their mind in route and changing a trip is cognitively much more complicated and complex than just going someplace. Uh, they may also panic in route for, something that happens or just for nothing that you would ever predict is going to happen and nothing that the vehicle is going to predict is going to happen. And the vehicle is going to have to be able to figure out how to handle that. Now, the best solution to en route problems will most likely involve people for any foreseeable future. Um, maybe somebody from the right service who's always available at a press of a button um, that would include people who can sign uh, with maybe access to information about the person, or maybe somebody who's familiar with the person would always be on call. Maybe you try to invoke the person's on-call person before you release any information uh, and then release the information if you can't get hold of them and you have to use one of the ride services people. Um, now, we also need to be looking at the fact in designing this interface, there are a lot of different things that we need to cover. For example, we may have tra uh, uh, travelers who have no memory. We may have travelers who are just really easily confused. They may have no ability to give clear instructions. They may speak with words or phrases that are only meaningful to themselves and not to this autonomous vehicle. It may be that it's meaningful to a human, but not the autonomous vehicle, but it may also be things that the vehicle needs to actually tease out and how well is it, uh, how good is it at doing that? Um, they may have no speech or they may have a foreign or a deaf accent that is strong enough that it can't be understood or they may not speak English. Um, they may speak another language clearly, which might be better than having them speak with a foreign accent in English. But if you have a deaf accent and the system is not set up for that, that's going to be a problem. 
they may only use sign language. And although we can have vehicles that would present in sign language, if they sign back to the vehicle, can the vehicle understand it? Um, they may not be able to see that a car has even arrived or assist the uh, automatic driver, whatever you wanna call the autonomous vehicle's uh, brain uh, in finding them. They may not be familiar with or able to use apps or smartphones at all. So just saying, oh, well, we'll all be doing it through an app. They may be hard of hearing and need to direct couple the audio in their hearing aids in order to hear things in what you would think was a not very noisy environment, but for somebody with a hearing aid, maybe um, completely masking. Um, and it may be mixed. You could have any or all of these things occurring at the same time. Now there's a number of different strategies that we might look at um, using ultra simple interfaces, no need for instructions for anyone, just completely obvious. And of course this would be of great benefit to everybody. Um, we can have a layered interface where it's very, very simple, limited interface, but people who want more can uh, invoke it and get it to unwrap. You can have one that doesn't require reading, that is it's verbal and it could be verbal by talking or verbal visual. But um, how do you uh, handle uh, things? If you try to do it non-verbally with pictures, illustrations, maps, um, this, there's an awful lot of people who can't understand. These things are often very, very obvious to the designer and completely oblivious to the user. Uh, and many people can't read a map to save their soul. It's got to work with sign language users. Everything needs to be presented in that is presented in voice text also needs to be uh, in sign. And sign language interpreters for the vehicle on call may be needed in order to have really effective two-way communication for any time in the future. Uh, you can use a cue and respond approach where you ask, they answer. You ask, they answer um, as a way that is cognitively much simpler than asking somebody to fill out or deal with a control panel or something like this. It's a very um, a simple uh, cognitively to do that kind of a thing. Um, you should be provide silenceable or optional description of the features like a bellhop when you enter the vehicle and either you make it so that it just automatically happens and you can tell it to shut up. You always need to be able to tell it to shut up. Or as Aaron said, maybe it's always on, except that if you have a smart device or some other key, you can save it that you never want it to do that. And then when you get in, it doesn't. So you default to the simple. And for people that are more technical, they can turn off things that would be um, annoying to them or unneeded to them. So start with the assumption it's needed. And then the smarter people can have it go away and the people that are less able get it in case they need it. Someday we could have full natural language, sufficiently intelligent artificial driver, but we have a while before we get there. Um, there may be a feature, somehow a feature for the driver. And again, here we mean the uh, agent that's driving um, to point out the passenger in a crowded or confusing location. Again, as Aaron pointed out, um, the cars may have no idea where this person is and whatever description there was. If the person isn't carrying a, an electronic device that you can home in on, how are you gonna be able to, to find it? Um, and how can the, the system give instructions back if the person who's being picked up is on a phone, for example, uh, how can the car tell the person uh, where they are? So something to guide the passenger to the vehicle uh, and again, it's, it's not going to be a way, it's going to have to be a number of ways. Um, having different colored lights works if you can see color and you can see. Um, tones may work if there's nothing around and no other vehicle, but if you've got a bunch of vehicles making sounds, that's not going to work. So we need to try to figure out something and it's going to have to vary to address all the different types. Um, it, it might be nice to have um, uh, tips that we provide to the uh, uh, drivers, not the AI so much, but the backup people to the AI that would be, if you will, pseudo driving in a situation where the AI fails to be able to find the person or meet the person so that they uh, make sure that they do uh, communicate in the proper way. 
And then again, uh, the ability to always have an instant uh, human in a loop option that you can bring in when it begins to fail. And then finally, something I'll call trip tags. Now, uh, a trip tag uh, would be something where a vehicle takes instructions from a tag. So the traveler walks up and has a tag they can just touch. Uh, so somebody with a cognitive disability could get in and just tap a tag for, and they would have different tags for different destinations. And it would be able to give all the instructions, even if the, the traveler themselves would not be able to reliably be able to give them. Now, this could be a physical token. Uh, it could be an electronic device like a phone. Um, and it might, and again, these are all options. Um, it might also tell the car to automatically send progress texts either to the person who sent them or to the place where the person's going so that somebody is gonna be there when the person arrives. Um, it may um, uh, have a tag that says that the traveler is not able to change their destination after starting, or the traveler may be tagged as a protected passenger so that the car behaves differently than it would for uh, a typical passenger. There may be visual or auditory monitoring en route uh, of the uh, passengers um, or the driver's view, if you will, or of the passenger. Um, the could have an option where the doors are locked until tagged at the destination to uh, keep a, a passenger from getting out when the car stops at a stop sign or pulls over for rain or something like this and the passenger gets out and now they're lost and the vehicle doesn't have access to them and nobody knows where the person is. Um, it's kind of a variation on package delivery, but with extra considerations, of course. Now, this is going to be very tricky to implement. Um, the vehicle is delivering people, not packages, and there's huge abuse of potential uh, here as well. Um, if you got into the car and somebody walked up with a tag and tagged the car to lock down and take you someplace, they could literally kidnap you um, using a feature. So this is going to be hard to do. Um, and there's huge uh, privacy uh, and data abuse potential. Any data collected about users with special accommodations can be used in many ways to the detriment of the traveler. They can be used to discriminate in employment, housing, travel. Um, anyone wanting to avoid risk can use data that these individuals are people that um, might be riskier to hire or to, to employ or to insure, uh, or they could be used to target them. They're easily confused. so it's easy to sell things to them or easy to attack them. So this is gonna be a really tough issue and um, perhaps uh, something like all data that's used by these systems is overseen by an external privacy and data ethics council to make sure that it is not data mined to the detriment of the user. Thank you. And now I'll pass this back to Sarah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vander Heiden. And we, our next presenter will be Daryl Cooper. Mr. Cooper is an attorney advisor in the Disability Rights Office of the Federal Communications Commission. He joined the FCC after the passage of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. He currently works to resolve disputes between consumers and companies regarding telecommunications and advanced communication services. Mr. Cooper holds a JD from Emory University. Mr. Cooper, the microphone is yours. Hi, this is Daryl. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, my topic today is how do we identify communication services in a car that are required to be accessible by FCC rules. For example, is calling a car, is that communication required to be accessible? What about asking the car to stop? Or what about saying that there's an emergency? My short question today is, when does a car become a phone? Next slide, please. So what are communications? I tried in the first um, section to summarize the three indicia of a communication. The first one is a communication must be a two-way interaction. We now use the word interaction because an interaction, a communication now also includes text messaging and email. That has to be accessible. The communication must be in real or near real time. 
We say near real time because email is not in real time. And the communication must be between two or more people. So the question is what services in an autonomous car might be covered? Um, one example would be um, if you have a phone in the car that will call people outside the car, that would be a traditional telephone service and that would be required to be um, covered. Um, another service that we've envisioned that might follow in or might be solutions for, I don't know, failures in an AI would be a two-way voice communication or two-way text communication with the car staff. That would be covered by our rules. Um, a two-way voice communication is non-interconnected VOIP. A two-way text communication is um, email and text messaging as I have right there. Um, there's one thing interesting I want to point out is that internet browsers that are installed on mobile phones, they're required under our statute to be accessible to people who are blind or visually impaired. Um, I think one thing you know, I wanted to point out is that our rules have been a huge success. Um, the CVAA was passed in 2010. Our new enforcement rules were passed in 2013 or enacted or implemented in 2013. Since that date, we have not had a single commission interpretive order ruling whether something is an advanced service or not. Um, to date, I, I believe that's been um, successful because companies and consumers get together and they decide what is a communication service and they decide together what is an appropriate disability solution for that particular community. Um, the rules give the service provider flexibility in coming up with the solution. However, if your car rider discovers that the solution is not accessible to them, they have a right to come to the FCC and talk to the Disability Rights Office and we'll get in touch with you and we'll discuss together what solution might be appropriate if the consumer is indeed correct. Um, what we have found is that for these communication services, there are already solutions in the marketplace. For example, um, for people who are blind or have mobility disabilities or cognitive disabilities, there's, there, there are some ways for um, them to activate a user interface to, to um, begin a phone call or begin a text message. Voice activation um, works. Um, there's also automatic speech recognition that has been working. Um, this works for text messaging and for voice. For people who are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf blind, or have speech impairments, there are text-based solutions like real-time text. And it's also our understanding that some of the ASR providers are uh, researching how to program their ASR to understand people with speech disabilities. Um, one of the things we've noticed is that there are cross benefits for um, things that are not communication services. And one thing you know I was thinking about when Greg was speaking is that you know if you have an interface um, for interfacing with a car on non-communication services, what did the interface you use to make a call is also the same interface that you use to communicate with the car about stopping or starting. Um, on uh, when he discussed hearing aids, you know, what if there's a place in the car where you can plug your hearing aid in or use Bluetooth and you would use that same connection so that you could hear what's going on in the car. So the, the services that, you know, the car company would implement or the accessibility solutions that the car company would implement for communication services could cross over and support the other services that people with disabilities would need. Um, next slide, please. Our rules also cover um, video programming and entertainment. Um, over the course of these sessions, it sounds like there might be a lot of noise going on in the car, um, which might include um, video programming. If there is video programming, our closed captioning rules would apply. If the programming would also be audio described for people who are blind. If there's local broadcast of emergency information, that would also need to be relayed to people with disabilities in an accessible manner. 
And our rules also, as I said before, require that user interfaces, program guides, devices that are used for communications and for video programming also need to be accessible. Um, for these cars to work, um, communication is everything. It always is. You know, it's communication is what life is all about. Um, you know, we you know we have to assume that all of your writers don't communicate in the same way, um, and we have to ask like if we're going to talk about independence, why would we leave people out? You need to talk to your writers now about solutions. Our FCC experience can provide you with guidance. Current market solutions can give you pointers and solutions. And it's a good idea to figure out solutions now before riders board your cars. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And we will next hear from Ted Guild. Mr. Guild works on W3C's systems team, leading an exceptional group of individuals responsible for W3C's global server infrastructure. They develop and deploy software for W3C's services to the public and support standards development with member and public collaborators. Mr. Guild is also the champion for W3C Automotive Activity, creating web standards for connected vehicles. He is based out of the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab office in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Welcome, Mr. Guild. Uh, thank you. Um, a quick correction. Um, uh, I sent a bio, but it looks like uh, you took that from um, an outdated page. Um, I'm no, I've relinquished uh, head of the systems team uh, a couple of years ago, um, focused more on automotive and spatial data in the web. Um, anyhow, um, I wanted to discuss uh, what we're doing as far as standards, W3C, that's pertinent to uh, this topic, um, specifically around um, how to make transportation more accessible. Next slide, please. So for those who are not familiar with W3C, it's the World Wide Web Consortium. Standards by for the web were founded by Tim Berners-Lee, who was the inventor of the web. We're headquartered at MIT. We also have host sites at uh, Beihan University in Beijing, KO in Japan, and Ersum, which is a research center um, uh, in the south of France, in Sophia Antipolis. We have about 450 members, uh, ranges from government entities, uh, tech giants, um, various content and solution providers, uh, people from media entertainment, um, automotive, web commerce, you name it, very diversified um, uh, audience. We have a large range of, of different standards. I'm just gonna focus on a couple. Um, next slide, please. So um, while it's not my area, I will discuss a little bit about the Web Accessibility Initiative. Uh, we have a, it's, uh, um, it's probably, from the outset been part of W3C, I'm not sure the exact history, I apologize. Uh, at least 24, 25 years, the way it's been around. It's a very strong community of very dedicated people um, working on trying to make the web accessible. A lot of these standards, uh, normative specs, for example, um, WCAG, which is Web Content Accessibility um, Guidelines and um, ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Applications, um, provide um, uh, designers, application developers, ways to um, make sure that their content is accessible for different, different um, accessibility needs. Uh, there's also quite a few best practices and informative notes to go taking that another step for, further, as far as making sure to explain things um, in, in detail, uh, various issues that people have to take into mind as far as their designs go. Um, there's also an accessible Platform architecture was a, a large um, ranging group. They their mandate is their charter is to oversee a um, vast array of emerging technologies and how the work that they've accumulated over the years can be applicable to help solve those um, issues. Um, next slide, please. 
So um, I lead the Dutch Automotive Working Group. Um, uh, so uh, auto manufacturers all do data differently. They all have proprietary APIs as far as how to interact with their vehicles. And this, of course, creates an interoperability mess. And interoperability is key for accessibility, to be able to have seamless interoperability, to be able to have consistencies, to have APIs that you can write um, dedicate, dedicated clients to that can um, bridge cognitive or sensory gaps. Um, we, so what we've come up with is a common API and a common data model. Um, we are building an ontology on top of that to enable artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, that enable, will enable um, decisions by vehicles, the autonomous vehicles. It'll enable assessment of the performance of autonomous vehicles. It'll enable um, interactions with um, other, other devices um, uh, through, through W3C's Web of Things. Um, we have a linked building data community group which is um, looking to create, an, it is creating ontologies to describe buildings capabilities and infrastructure. And this goes down to the level of um, needs for accessibility concerns. Where are the elevators? Where is, you know, um, where are the wheelchair ramps? Where, where are egresses? Um, be able to help people navigate, provide information um, so that the clients on their behalf can provide um, potentially augmented reality to um, facilitate some of their, their various um, individualized needs. Uh, there's a linked data for accessibility community group uh, that I encourage uh, forming. Um, this is um, taking it um, sort of uh, further and not just uh, dealing with buildings, but dealing with transportation, with you know, um, um, where to find um, uh, uh, restaurants that are accessible to wheelchairs that have ramps, where these things are located. Um, and I am also heavily involved in cross standards development with other um, standards development organizations. Um, ISO Intelligent Transportation Systems, ISO Smart Cities, Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, Geneva Alliance, among others. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, September of 2019, I held a transportation data workshop at Uber in California. And um, uh, a colleague from, um, she works with the Linux Foundation, but is part of the Way community, Yanina Seika, uh, was with me. She's blind. And um, we gave a presentation together. And as part of that, she relayed a number of her um, ride handling and other transportation um, issues um, that, that she's experienced. Um, I was impressed by how, what the reaction was and how the Uber engineers made sure to follow her into the parking lot with her permission and shoulder surf and watch her interoperability with um, their application to find what they're doing wrong. It is so often an afterthought. Um, I've been um, uh, part of W3C for 21 years. And um, it's an international organization. We have meetings um, normally um, you know, in various parts of the world. And I am, um, I am in awe and um, uh, at, at sort of the, the dedication that some of these people have. And, and you know, I, I have no right to complain in traveling half around the world and having to try and navigate um, foreign languages and, and being jet lagged in different transportation systems wanting to find at my destination someone who's in a wheelchair that was broken because of um, mishandling by the airline or is visually impaired. So is this um, sort of blows me away at the dedication of the of, of these people working on accessibility. Um, before I started W3C, and what actually led me there was um, in uh, 1999, I was working on a online uh, mortgage website, loisloan.com, um, which was a uh, startup underneath um, the Trump organization, in fact. Um, Hurricane Floyd came in um, while I was in Manhattan. I had to go up to Westchester to um, meet with um, the provider of the rate engine we were um, going to select. And um, I get off the um, train, onto the platform, 
um, and uh, the boss to, to hail a cab and a woman grabs me by the, by the arm and says, I am blind, cabs will not stop for me, hail us a cab. It was a demand, it was not a request, I abided. Um, that's you know, how I was raised. Um, after we figure out the, um, our respective destinations and her German shepherd is laying across my, her white German shepherd is laying across my suit, um, we had a chance to talk and she asked what I did. I told her I did web development. She asked if I knew about um, accessibility for the web. I said, I did. I, one of um, uh, previous clients was Unum Mutual Insurance. We had to do things to the Bobby Standard. She was not happy with the Bobby Standard. She insisted before um, she left the cab that I would agree to go to the website and read up on Way, the Web Accessibility Initiative, uh, which I did, obviously, and sort of led me to, to join the organization in the long run. Next slide, please. So there's tremendous excitement as we've been hearing around autonomous vehicles. Is it, is it an enabler um, for those with various um, uh, disabilities? Uh, people, it, it re receives tremendous type um, in general. It's, we've heard it was gonna be here by 2020, it's not. Um, or, you know, people are sort of claiming that it is, but we're only at level four. It is coming, it, there's quite a bit of work to do. Um, first 90% is relatively easy, the last 10 is gonna be really difficult. And even more difficult is making sure that all these designs are accessible. Um, it is absolutely um, imperative, but it's also sort of often taken as an afterthought, unfortunately. Um, they're, they're more worried about sort of um, uh, trying to have some uh, schnazzy interfaces, not necessarily thinking about accessibility. They're not learning from some of the experiences that we have um, at W3C, encouraging uh, people to do things well on the web. Next slide, please. So um, although, as uh, noted earlier, any sort of personal data is highly sensitive, it can be misused, um, but I uh, feel that it's sort of essential, essential, as was also described, that um, individuals needs, you know, a profile um, that perhaps um, has limited information about the individual, but is able to convey to a vehicle operator um, the individual's needs. So if you should send a vehicle that can accommodate a wheelchair if the person requires it. Um, individual vehicles will have varying capabilities. You know, if, when um, to be a mix of interactions, you want to make sure there's an interface that um, can accommodate that there's braille in appropriate places, that um, it's able to pair with devices and you can bring your own device, which may have client software that can interact with the vehicle um, because it's voice interface is lacking um, or um, maybe has assistive uh, technology for um, uh, be able to override autonomous vehicles um, to be able to um, have a handbrake because uh, you can't use your, your legs. Uh, these are all sort of important things to, to um, take in consideration and make sure that uh, when um, to make sure that the technologies meet the, the needs of the, the, the individuals. Um, you know, with the uh, linked building data, linked uh, data for accessibility, we want to see granular uh, location data. We want to make sure that you drop off someone where um, where the there's not a curb that the that they're able to um, bring the wheelchair up onto the on the sidewalk or or near a a, a wheelchair ramp. Um, you want to make sure that um, where you're picking them up is not somewhere, somewhere that's dangerous uh, for them to um, be able to get into the vehicle, especially if they're you know, visually impaired, as was mentioned earlier. Um, you want to um, have, if you're building intelligent transportation systems, they rather look, look rather foolish if they drop off a person at a staircase that, that can um, accommodate um, their needs. Um, so, uh, I'm trying, oh, um, so I uh, sort of mentioned sort of alternate controls or, or pair devices already. So that's um, going to be extremely important because you know, the interfaces are going to be are customized or be brand specific because that's what they do. So it's going to be very important to be able to allow um, uh, vehicles to be customized or to be able to pair with additional hardware and devices that can uh, accommodate as needed. Um, next slide, please. slide please. 
So why introduce the topic? Well, it's easier and far cheaper to do things well upfront to take accessibility needs um, um, as part of your design, um, uh, your, your design and requirements phase. Not as an afterthought. Uh, as an afterthought, it's going to be clunky. It's not going to be um, as seamless. It's going to be uh, um, incomplete, most likely. Um, technologists, you know, uh, web software developers, you know, developers in general, like to do things right. They like to improve lives. Um, they don't do this out of anything other than ignorance or um, a tight timeline and, and budget restrictions. But um, um, so I, um, for those in the audience that are working on, on um, uh, adaptive technologies for autonomous vehicles, make the case strong, make the case strong upfront. Um, this is gonna save your organization a lot in the long run. Um, you know, lack of performance of the ADA is potentially gonna be costly. We're just hearing about the FCC, you know, um, uh, as one of the many different agencies in the US that can um, enforce things. Uh, the fines that you hear with GDPR are rather pronounced, rather swift in, in, in their delivery and um, not appealable. Um, I hope to see something stronger like that as far as accessibility um, in, in transportation. Um, it's also very important to notice that um, this is not a negligible market share. You're not, um, it should be, the reason why you should take it into consideration up front is because estimated 50% of Americans have some form of accessibility concerns. And you, that's a rather significant um, portion of, of your audience. Um, uh, I'll skip some examples in the interest of time. So next slide, please. So um, I provided the landing pages for the Web Accessibility Initiative and the automotive activity. Um, if you want to learn more and get involved, uh, please do so. I did not provide my email address because uh, actually I'm leaving W2C and MIT after 21 years, I'm going to work for Geotab, who's a uh, commercial uh, vehicle telematics uh, provider who does take accessibility um, uh, seriously and is incorporated in their, in their products and solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted Guild. This is Bruce Bailey. I'm on staff here on the Access Board, and we get a lot of questions about how and would 508, which are technology regulations that the Access Board promulgates, how would those apply uh, or would they apply to autonomous vehicles? And as it happens on March 30th, we did a webinar on our hardware chapter, and we talked about in particular um, self-contained closed products, closed products with closed functionality and the requirements for speech output enabled. I'm not gonna dive in to any of those uh, requirements. What I wanna focus for today for just two minutes here is on four slides from that presentation where we talk about the definition for information communication technology and the definition for information technology. So information technology is, or I'm sorry, information communication technology is information technology and, and other equipment, systems, technologies, or processes for which the principal function is the creation, manipulation, storage, display, receipt, or transmission of electronic data and information, as well as any associated content. So that's why 508 applies to, say, uh, your word processing documents and web pages clearly, even though those might not fit the definition for information technology. Next slide, please. So here's a photo of a nice big red truck, one of these over, over the road vehicles. And again, we used this exact same photo back on the 30th. These things are very high tech. Um, they have all kinds of tracking information, um, you know, satellite communication, data on mileage and how many hours it's been running. I mean, a lot of computation going on with these things. And of course, these over the road trucking is probably going to be one of the very first things that are autonomous. Not so much interest to all of us who are looking forward to getting, you know, having our smart cars drive us around. That's not going to be happening. Um, you know, that you're not going to be having one of these huge 18 wheelers pull up for you to get in and take you someplace, but they are also targeted for being autonomous. And so the question we get a lot, is it covered by 508? Is it ICT? So a truck, is not ICT. 
the principal function is not the creation, manipulation, storage, display, receipt, or transmission of electronic data and information. But let's go to the, um, the next slide, please. And again, in 508, we're statutorily directed to use the clear, what we call the clear Cohen definition of information technology, 40 USC 11101. And I'm not going to read this whole definition, but the you know the formal definition about information technology with respect to executive agency means any equipment, internet interconnected system or subsystems. And let's go on to the next slide. So consider that over the road truck or even a modern vehicle or dashboard and all those action verbs from that Klinger Cohen definition for information technology. And the excerpt here is used in the automatic acquisition, storage, analysis, analysis, evaluation, manipulation, management, movement, control, display, switching, interchange, transmission, or reception of data information. Those are all action words that I think most people would say an automated over the road truck is doing. And if you've got a vehicular dashboard, that's some of those things. Uh, if in that vehicular dashboard might be in a big truck like that, or it might be, you know, in your personal autonomous vehicle. Um, so, you know, what the dashboard is displaying at least is not a principal function relative to the function of driving. But it gets very interesting if there's no person driving. Because, you know, then is, is the principal function isn't isn't driving, it's going for a ride, right? Um, so, but the access board doesn't want to answer, you know, we're, we're not going to try and figure out when does a vehicle become information technology or not. We'll defer to other people reading the Klinger Cohen definition of information technology. And so with that, I would like to transition us to the next slide for our open discussion. And again, I'll be moderating this. Um, I'm gonna be going kind of round robin, paraphrasing questions that we've gotten in on the, um, on the Q and A panel. Please do, please do um, continue entering those in. I'm gonna go through all of our uh, panelists, starting with Dr. Aaron Steinfeld, Dr. Greg Vanderheiden, and then Daryl Cooper, and then Ted Guild, one, one for each, and then we'll see um, where we go from there. So um, Dr. Aaron Seinfeld, uh, Los Angeles County, California wrote in and they were asking that they created a mock-up of an interior cabin using 3D printer to use for orientation and mobility to visually impaired people, members of their advisory committee. Do you think those sort of small mock-ups are useful in demonstrating how a system could work? And you know, would that be used in the, for the public as well? So uh, this has also been done by other transit agencies uh, uh, to support travel training within their systems. I know here, for example, in Pittsburgh, uh, they have a fare box uh, available for part of the travel training purposes. Um, I think there's, a, there's an easy answer and a complicated answer. The easy answer is that when uh, the autonomous system is owned and operated or contracted by a public entity, and there's a large number of them uh, in that region, it makes sense. Um, having said this, uh, what we're seeing in the autonomous vehicle industry is a number of different players um, all competing against each other. And so there could easily be you know, three, four, maybe even five different uh, vehicle types uh, uh, in operation um, across several different uh, uh, providers. So uh, it may be better to instead focus on uh, kind of like demo days or, or uh, kind of scheduled events where the local, the, operate, the local office of the operator arranges for vehicles to be brought by, you know, every 14 days or every seven days or whatever uh, for specific training on those individual vehicles. Um, uh, I think it's going to be very hard to uh, build mock-ups of every single system. Uh, when there's going to be a very high amount of variability. Thank you very much. And then 
we had another question come in. And again, this is for Greg Vanderheiden, but while you were speaking uh, with your initial pre presentation, Aaron Steinfeld, and this is again, one of the nice things about having the dovetailing, the question came out about, you know, how does somebody with a cognitive disability um, identify that the car is for them? And then the commenter came back, oh, it's great, Dr. Van der Heijn, to see how many interfaces you're, you're addressing here. So you kind of answer that question, like, you know, you have an alpha numeric string on the top of a taxi cab. That's, that's not a good way for many people to identify a taxi, but particularly if you're not sighted, in particular, you have a cognitive disability. So um, Dr. Van der Heijn, I want to ask you about the bellhop feature um, you described. And that, and, you know, what you, you talked about what the, the dialogue somebody might get from a robot car. I was wondering if you had some, share some thoughts on what the visual presentation um, of that bellhop might be. And I must mention that we were discussing that all I could think of was Johnny Cab from Total Recall in 1990, which was a fairly terrifying implementation of a robot taxi driver. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the first thing is that the robot driver does not have to be facing the other direction. They can be looking straight at you since they're obviously not driving the car. <clears throat> But I would think it could be uh, an individual who is talking and doing sign language at the same time um, where it's captioned. Uh, and so you have the text, you've got the audio and you have the lip reading and you have the sign language. Um, and they would just be talking about and familiarizing for the person. And of course, there's a big, um, you know, skip it or be quiet or whatever <laughs> button. Um, the For the person who is blind, they can just talk again, you know, how are you going to interact back? I'm less concerned about how the, the device would communicate with the individual than I am how the individual is going to communicate back to the device. Um, speech recognition is not that great. If it's noisy, it's not great. With an accent, it's not great. If the person's using sign language, you got a problem. Um, so Everything works until the first thing that doesn't work and the individual starts talking back to you. And that's where most of these systems are, are going to fall down. Um, I, I did want to uh, pick up on one thing that was uh, commented by uh, earlier though, and, and the idea that the same means that the person used to call the vehicle would be used when you got into the vehicle. And I think that's really a powerful idea. If the person called up on the phone and made an arrangement by voice, when they get in that same phone, what if the audio came back through that? So if they have a phone and it already couples with their hearing aid, when they get in the car, they already have an audio channel coupled to their hearing aid. If they were doing uh, uh, getting the information using the screen reader built into the phone, when they got into the car, the information would be available using the same interface that they already know how to use. If they're not using a smartphone at all, they were using a phone, it would work. Um, as long as whatever they were using was mobile, it could be used to say, I am here now. It could say, I'm going to beep my horn twice, beep, beep. Uh, and the person now who's blind, uh, even if there's a lot of noise going on and a lot of cars around, um, he says, I'm going to do it now, beep, beep and he hears it from the phone and he hears it in his environment. Um, so these are, this is a really, I think, a powerful way because the, whatever the person's using is already tuned to them and you would continue the communication using the same mechanism, including if you did it through a, a video relay service or something like that, um, that you would then have sign language interpretation uh, there as well. So um, this is an interesting one of whether or not the uh, FCC wants to pay for someone to be um, sitting on the line waiting for a cab to arrive. But, um, you know, as we advance, uh, maybe we can advance in, in that area as well. Thank you, Dr. Van Heinen. And that also dovetails nicely to this, my next question for Daryl in a related, uh, somebody wrote in that, you know, you, you, Daryl, you mentioned the FCC does not cover, you, you know, one of your requirements is that it's between the conversation between two people. So I understand that means like uh, interact, interactive voice response systems are not covered um, by the FCC regulation. But so the but the question is when does the natural dialogue um, between a rider, a human rider, and this autonomous AI vehicle is, is that a conversation between two people? 
Uh, this is Daryl. Bruce, that's a great question. Uh, let me go back and correct one thing I said. These IVRs, the interactive voice response systems, are covered if it's being off, if you're calling your telephone provider and you're going through one of those, that has to be accessible. So I just wanted to point that out. But yeah, I mean, people have been asking us about that. What if you have a really smart AI, you know, acting on behalf of the company or, or whatever? Is that a conversation? I mean, right now, I think it's just a conversation, you know, kind of for fun. Um, I don't know if anybody's, you know, considered it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't know if the statute would have to be rewritten for that. Yeah, Bruce, if I can pop in here. I, uh, uh, this is going to be a really difficult thing because we're already seeing that um, companies replaced all the receptionists with these auto receptionists. And so as long as it finally got to talking to a human being, it was covered because that was considered on the path to getting to the human being. But when we get it to the point where the person you want to talk to, you think you're talking to a human being, but they've replaced all the customer uh, service agents with AIs, then suddenly everybody with a disability no longer has any right to have access to these places uh, simply because they swapped out uh, auto humans for humans. And so that suddenly means that they no longer have to be accessible. Um, and, and as he pointed out, um, uh, they'll just point it out. Um, it may require that we look at that in, in legislation because, you know, where do you draw the line? <clears throat> but this is something that we should be talking about right now, because it's going to be here very, very quickly, where people, places where we think we're talking to human beings, we aren't. Um, and it may not even be distinguishable when you are and aren't talking to a human being. Uh, and pretty soon, even when you're visually seeing the person, you won't be able to tell you're not looking at a human being. So um, when you have a pseudo human, you know, does that fall into the same place or not? And if not, then there's very rapidly going to be a whole bunch of the of the world that's going to drop out of accessibility. You know, one other thing I want to oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Daryl. Oh, well, um... You know, sometimes I think the only accessibility solution might be talking to a human being. You know, our, our rules also cover um, customer service, manuals, uh, information on websites that help you figure out how to use a phone or how to use email. And like one of the worst things you can happen to you is like if you lose your password, right? It used to be really hard back in the day. And we had a gentleman with a um, disability call. He had lost his password, but he had no direct way to get in touch with the email company to get his password. And it seemed to us at the time, like there had to be an 800 number for that person to have an accessible solution. So one of the things I'm wondering here is, does the accommodation have to be, the person has to be able to reach a live person? Um, that, that feeds into my next question for Ted Guild actually. Um, Ted, I'm wondering if you can suggest um, some W3C standards that might help negotiate the, you know, between humans and the artificial intelligence. And I'll note that, you know, I've, the W3C has some good documents on CAPTCHA. Um, there's also, um, uh, you know, the other other things for you know quality of speech and inflection um I, I may be asking you to comment on stuff that's a little bit out of your direct bailiwick but uh and then i know the the w3c is also you know daryl mentioned the uh the chat bot kind of things that there's some work there's some activity with the silver draft that there be human contact in addition to an automated chat bot so um offhand um um I mean, Wicagon area um, do sort of get into to some of that. Um, but I was saying, um, I, because the interfaces are gonna be so different and brand specific um, and the capabilities are gonna be varied as far as the, the quality of the, the voice systems and how the AI systems are. Um, I, I really want to see interfaces, you know, the common API, the common API and um, to be able to bring your own device and have it be able to interact with the vehicle. Um, if you um, are visually and um, hearing impaired, 
and need to go off the braille, um, and you have a device that you can bring to the vehicle and, and provide that, um, that's not something that the, the manufacturer is likely going to accommodate it in, in, into their design. So there, there'll be sort of um, edge cases where the, the best solution, in my opinion, is going to be um, an, a, an, a device that is of the individual's um, ownership and configuration and tailored to their individual needs that the vehicle can, um, can accommodate. I Sorry. think that is that's the best solution. Sorry, I think I would like to ask a little bit more about um, personalization. Uh, I know Greg Vanderheim, that's an uh, interest of yours. Um, but again, Ted, while you're, we've got you on the line here uh, directly, can you speak to some of the work that the WAI folks have been doing around uh, cognitive disabilities and issue? I know that's uh, something that's really slow to come up with uh, the technical requirements per se. Yep. Um, as you uh, noted earlier, this is also my family way. Um, so I, I, um, I do know that there is, a, there is cognitive work uh, taking place, um, but I, I can't speak to it sufficiently to, to do justice. So apologies. It's no, it's no, it's no problem. It's a, it's a, um, a tough area, and I know there's some activity in uh, various groups on the W3C with, with that. Yeah, I, I don't want to misrepresent anything wrong and misrepresent it. Oh, and I wanted to speak your URLs that you had up, because those are great, and they're short w3.org slash WAI yep. and w3.org slash AUTO auto. Yep. Thank you. There's a, a, another good place to go, which is the developer space. <clears throat> and that's gpii.net slash. Um, uh, and just go there and then you can click on the uh, developer space link. Um, there's a master list, which is a, a compilation of all the different strategies that we've been able to identify uh, internationally. Um, and we're also trying to put other uh, resource sheets like all of the information about this and all the information about that. So um, that's a good place to go look for those kinds of things. And also if uh, you have one or you know of one, uh, let me know so that we can get it linked to from there as well, since that's a good uh, central reference point for trying to find the all abouts. Uh, and we're going to be putting up there just shortly uh, something also, which we'll be showing at the access board uh, soon. And that is a compilation of all of the provisions for all of the different ICT accessibility standards um, sorted so that you can see all of the same provisions uh, for each different area. So you can say, well, what does this provision look like in 508 and in the European and in the Canadian and then the air carriers? Okay, how about the next provision? What does that look like in all of these different places? Um, Bruce, if you don't mind, I'd like to also jump in about the human operator, the, ex the remote operator question um, that you had. Um, the nature of driving an autonomous vehicle in a complex uh, environment like an urban area or even a suburban area that has construction um, means that many of these autonomous vehicle service providers are going to be relying on um, essentially vehicle handlers, people who are not quite dispatchers, but more like people who will be able to assist and provide guidance to these, robot, these uh, robotic vehicles from a distance. So they won't remote into the car to drive it. That's actually very, very dangerous. But they might do remote in and say, this is a construction sign. This part of the road is safe. This part is not. Um, so there's already going to be, uh, there's already likely going to be uh, work by some of these providing some of these companies to provide this sort of essentially on-demand human assistance for their vehicles, it would not be a big jump to also have on-demand uh, human assistance for the riders in those vehicles. Um, and so I think from a technological perspective, it, it's, it would not be difficult to do this. It's more a function of uh, will the service providers um, feel that it is in their best interest to provide such service. So there was a related question that came in about the tags aspect that Greg Vanderhuden spoke about. And again, uh, Ted Geld, if you wanted to care to weigh in on this, it does seem like there would be W3C technologies that might convey that. Um, but, you know, specifically, you know, I, I think Greg just alluded to the problems with this. Who, who's going to make those up? Um, how would that might those get enforced? And when do they come into play? Aaron Seinfeld just asked about, you know, construction would be different rules than you know, just being at a stop sign, um, 
but you know, most people, you don't want getting out of your vehicle if you're stopped at a red light. So what, what's, what are some of the, um, what are, what are going to, what will we see as some of the first implementation of the, the tags idea? Um, so there, uh, um, sort of like tags, as far as like an object identification, there, there's already quite a bit that's done, um, um, at present, uh, like obviously Grenis system here, um, in rigs that are high 90%, um, able to tell that's the, um, uh, the front, uh, portion of a, a tire of a bicycle um, that's about to sort of come around a corner kind of thing. Um, so they're, they're able to um, get quite a few of these things um, very accurately, have, have built up uh, big dictionaries of, of, of object definitions. So that's, um, that's in place, um, it's proprietary um, uh, solutions at present, I'm not seeing any movement towards standardization there, unfortunately. Um, that's another problem with the, the autonomous area. Everyone's sort of racing to be first, and there's not as much cooperation as um, I would like to see in that space. Um, so the it would be um, so it, it could be also misunderstanding your question, um, but it sounds like you're looking for um, for the uh, various situations to be tagged and be done so consistently. Uh, that might be given the lack of uh, cooperation, collaboration on Steam. That might be something that um, should come out of um, out, out, out of regulators. Um, there's a um, some ontology work that's getting started um, at EDM Council um, uh, on um, building ontology for autonomous vehicles um, and sort of defining their capabilities. That might be a good forum to try and bring that to. The um, <clears throat> the tags in that I was referring to um, would be something on the order of um, uh, something that you could walk up, and I think the first place you'll see the application of this will be in. Uh, in package delivery, where you go up to a vehicle and you put a package inside and you um, and use a tag um, uh, of some type to say this is the package that's supposed to go to uh, such and such a place, and the vehicle locks itself down, goes there, and and somebody at the other end can uh, get in and remove it. So yeah. I think that's probably the first place we'll see this kind of a, a thing where you're using these vehicles as as couriers. Um, and uh, for sec secure transport. Um, we, we're, we're, we, we do have um, some work on remote procedure calls. And that's one of the use cases uh, it's for unintended delivery and pick up from vehicles in the trunks um, yep. for sure. And um, uh, as far as like tagging, I could see um, you know, RFIDs that could be sort of related to the vehicle before as sort of a, another means to authenticate um, so that you could sort of know that the Person opening the trunk, um, claiming to have a package, is is the package you're expecting. Right. And the other thing is that now, of course, we're seeing Apple and and lots of other companies coming out with these uh, small tags that you could put on a uh, person or on a package or something. Uh, particularly nice to have a person carrying one because um, if they did get off track or get out or get lost, um, it is possible to track them very, very uh, accurately to within feet of where they are. And we've never had that before. So that can be tremendous for people with cognitive disabilities if that could be somehow attached to them in a fashion that they won't take it off um, or don't accidentally lose it. Uh, it would allow them to have more freedom because if something happened, you'd be able to locate them rather uh, quickly. So that um, is... Uh, is um... NFC is in a lot of smartphones. That's how like the, some of the, the payment systems are working. Um, Apple's is a little bit more locked up than Android's, which you're seeing uh, more innovation um, in um, Apple's enabled just for Apple Pay, um, maybe a couple of their use cases. And besides uh, that, these, that will be. Right. I was referring to the tags they just announced. Yeah, the, the, the for key chains and such. And, yeah. Right, which can be read by Android devices as well as Apple devices. So it's it's uh, it's something that has a, a broader uh, broader reach. Go ahead, Aaron. 
Um, I was going to say that you don't have to rely on a physical object. Um, and in fact, we've seen some examples already where um, people's interaction with a service is uh, their preferences are conveyed into the uh, to the vehicle. Um, so, for example, uh, it is possible uh, to indicate that you have a specific disability in some of the ride sharing apps. That information is used to find an appropriate uh, ride to, uh, in terms of a ride match, but they also will often pass that information down to the driver so the driver knows how to interact with the rider when they show up. Um, there's even been some other kind of examples where you could you could show like that this sort of preference thing could matter. So uh, a good example is um, there was a, one of these rideshare services had a, an agreement with a, a streaming music service um, so for a period of time, it was possible to essentially uh, have your music playing in the car when you got picked up instead of the driver's music. Um, this is an extreme example, but this shows that it's possible to pass preferences from the rider into the vehicle. Um, and that sort of capability could be used for uh, uh, a lot more uh, uh, accessibility features along the lines of what Greg is describing. So if you don't want to go with a physical object, you can still do it with an electronic token. Yeah, well, I've got one last question here that I'm going to try and uh, sneak in before we have to close. Um, the, the question about you know these autonomous vehicles becoming a viable form of public trans transit, um, and the concern that you know if they're private vehicles, they're not going to be accessible to people using wheelchairs probably they're not going to be accessible to somebody who's blind um so you know what's you know, is there some some conversation you would like to suggest to regulators or legislators we're not going to get any any hard decisions on this and then Daryl the other thing I want to bring you on on this I'd, I'd rec I want to bring up the example of you know public phones we used to have a lot of you know requirements for how accessible public phones were and that they had the heart of the, you know, the, the volume control and how the reach height. And of course, that's all gone now. So, so is there, a, is there an analogy there for? I'll, I'll answer your first part, <laughs> which has to do with related to public transit and, and some of the ride share services. So we know that many of the ride share services will become the service providers for, for shared autonomous vehicle rides. Um, we know that uh, when a local municipality wants to, it can, uh, through public policy, uh, create rules that require uh, accessible service and, ex and accommodations to be made. Um, this has occurred in a variety of different locations uh, in different forms, um, but the local municipalities have an enormous amount of power in this regard. Um, and we've seen this in a couple of different places around the country. Um, so in that sense, uh, the mandate or requirement of, of accessible service or accommodations um, could in many cases be driven by local, local regulations and local requirements. Um, obviously this creates a patchwork and that's somewhat problematic. And that's where Daryl and the <laughs> federal government come in and I'll, I'll now hand it off to him. Um, hi, um, this is Daryl. Um, Bruce, thanks for your question. Yeah, those rules that apply to pay phones, they're still in existence, but there aren't any pay phones, you know. <laughs> um, that's it. They're going to be in existence for the, until forever. I mean, there's still, the statute still requires fair compensation, and that statute's going to exist forever. Um, the good news is wireline phones and all wireless phones, every single one of those phones is required to be accessible. And so, you know, if there are you know, people who want a, a less expensive phone, um, they can get a feature, we call it a feature phone, a basic phone that just, you, you call, you text, and that's inexpensive. Um, you know, people use, people still use um, prepaid calling cards that you can buy, like if you need to call long distances. Um, that service is through like either a switch base reseller or a reseller. That service is supposed to be accessible and also use an accessible device. Um, our rules, I, you know, I have had some, um, some filings by people with autism and a lot of times the crossover there is like with people who are blind, they need a, they need a larger screen so they can see what the text messages are. They need a simple interface, you know, so a feature phone might be more suitable for them. I also found in talking to people that, um, people who do accessibility work for, um, local governments and for cities, 
know a lot more about solutions um, than we do at the federal level. Uh, <clears throat> one quick comment is, uh, I like the, the, the comments, as we're trying to move forward into new areas, that really help to uh, uh, cause people to take action in the legislative area. And they are um, stories, numbers, and solutions. Um, just talking about it in the abstract, uh, they, they hear everything all the time and nothing happens. But when they hear stories, it becomes personal, it becomes individual, it becomes real. Uh, numbers, when you can talk about the number of people that can be affected. Uh, and then finally, if you can say, and here's a solution, especially if there's a solution that somebody's already implemented, but if they see that there's an easy way of solving it that is affordable, that in fact, there's a lot of people having the problem and it's, and it's, a, and it's a, a something that means has meaning to them, that's the story. Um, I think that's when we're going to see change. And so if you want to see change, we should work at gathering those three things together before you go sit down uh, and talking with uh, the people that you want to have uh, creating rules or regulations. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. We're very grateful to all our presenters. If we could go to our dialogue slide, please. Remind folks that we have an online form to follow up from each of the sessions and this the session's no different. So we're gonna have a, a continuing online conversation, please, about next steps in particular. Where, where do we go from here? Um, Transportationinnovation.ideascale.com. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Karen Tamley. Great, thanks so much, everybody. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. On behalf of the board, I want to extend my appreciation to each of our presenters today for your expertise that you shared with us. Um, all of you as presenters, um, you know, today, but also as, the, as part of the other sessions of the forum, really provided us with valuable data and guidance on designing autonomous vehicles that are inclusive of all passengers. I wanna thank all of you, our audience, for joining us today and providing your input. We encourage you, as was said, to further share your comments and ideas through the online discussion platform, including the recommendations and feedback on next steps in this effort. We appreciate you for being part of this important discussion to help ensure that autonomous vehicles are fully accessible to everyone and that we leave no one behind. Um, again, I'm Karen Tamley, a board member of the Access Board, and thank you again for joining us today. This is Rosemary Axel.